This is a short video on placenta previa. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of placenta previa. As in all of these flowcharts, each of the boxes is color-coded according to this legend in the top right, and I'll be clearing all of the boxes and repopulating the flowchart one by one as we talk about each concept. Let's go ahead and get started with the pathophysiology of placenta previa. Now, placenta previa can be defined as when the placenta is either partially or completely covering the internal os of the uterus. And this usually happens when you have endometrial damage close to the os in the lower uterine segment. Now, the endometrial damage usually causes some kind of scar tissue. If you have a break in the endometrium, the body's going to attempt to repair that. You'll have an inflammatory pathway. You'll have cytokines that come and repair that endometrium and cause uterine scarring. That uterine scarring is important because it creates an environment that has high oxygen and high collagen. And it turns out that the zygote, the fertilized egg, tends to want to implant in a rich environment that has oxygen and collagen. So when that zygote implants, it's predisposed to implant in an area that is next to or around the scar. So the scar that has oxygen and collagen kind of attracts the implantation of the zygote, and once that zygote implants, it starts dividing. When it divides, it becomes a blastocyst, and the trophoblastic cells around the blastocyst are what develop into the placenta. So this placenta is kind of predisposed to being next to the uterine scar. That's where the endometrial damage originally occurred. When that scar, when that placenta forms near the os, the internal os of the uterus, you have placenta previa. So that alone can cause placenta previa. In addition, the placenta tends to grow toward areas of the uterus that have increased blood supply. And it turns out that the uterine fundus, which is close to the internal os, does have increased blood supply. So when the placenta starts to expand, when it starts to grow, it'll favor growth toward that direction. The other side of the placenta actually will atrophy, will actually get smaller. And although the, plac the placenta is not actually moving during the pregnancy, it'll have this migration-like effect as it kind of grows toward the uterine fundus with increased blood supply and kind of atrophies away from the other side of the placenta. So that can also kind of worsen the condition. That can worsen the amount of coverage over the internal os. Now, what exactly causes this damage in the lower uterine segment? It's usually something iatrogenic, and I've listed some causes here. So it's usually a previous procedure or a previous incident, some previous damage to the uterus that that woman has encountered. Previous curettage, for instance, as part of a previous DNC can cause endometrial damage that leads to placenta previa. Previous suction can do it as well. Prior C-sections are definitely a risk factor and a well-established etiology previous abortions and recurrent abortions. This is because abortions usually uh, involve kind of scraping away the inside of the uterus, the endometrium. Sometimes you end up doing a curettage after an abortion anyway, and that of course causes damage to the endometrium, which can predispose you to placenta previa. In addition, there are some other risk factors that are less associated with, endo with endometrial damage, but still cause placenta previa. These are more correlations, and I've listed them here. Patients that have had previous placenta previas, of course, can have another one in the future. If they had some kind of risk factor or some kind of damage to the uterus the first time, they're more likely to have a placenta previa the second time for that same reason. Moms who have had assisted reproductive technology are predisposed to having placenta previa. Mothers with advanced age that's above 35 years old when they become pregnant are predisposed to have placenta previa. Multiparity, so having multiple children and having a short interval between pregnancies can also predispose you to placenta previa. Now let's get into the manifestations of placenta previa. It usually presents in the third trimester before the rupture of membranes. And the presenting symptom is usually a sudden painless bright red vaginal bleeding. Now this painless is important and we'll get to why in a second. And the fact that it happens before the rupture of membranes is relevant because <clears throat> the gestational sac can actually exert more pressure on the placenta that can cause more bleeding. So that's why it usually happens when the gestational sac gets big in the third trimester and before rupture of membranes, before you have that release of pressure. Now remember, if you see antepartum hemorrhage in a patient, you want to avoid a digital rectal exam, especially if it's around that delivery time. You don't want your first instinct to be a physical exam without knowing what you're getting yourself into. Um, you don't want to make the placenta, you don't want to damage the placenta any more than it's already in the way, any more than it's already damaged.
In addition, patients can have these recurrent episodes of bleeding over some time, over a few weeks. These episodes of bleeding are usually self-limited and they tend to reoccur during the onset of labor when mom starts to have those contractions that again create that pressure of the placenta against the internal os. So in severe cases of hemorrhage, the patient can actually go into hemorrhagic shock. And this is pretty uh, rare. This doesn't happen to most cases of placenta previa. But in this case, the mom can have hypotension and tachycardia. But again, this is in pretty severe cases of hemorrhage. There are some pertinent negatives that are worth knowing. I mentioned that this bleeding was painless, and indeed the uterus is soft and non-tender. This is important to differentiate placenta previa from placental abruption, which also causes third trimester bleeding, but is very painful. So if you have a soft, non-tender uterus on your, uh, on your exam, if the patient's not complaining of pain, it might be more likely to be placenta previa. If they are complaining of pain, you should consider placental abruption. Another pertinent negative is that the, fet the fetus, the baby, does not have any distress. This is because the blood coming out of the placenta previa is mom's blood. The blood loss is maternal. This isn't a guarantee. It's possible to have fetal distress if mom loses so much blood, becomes hypoxic, and is unable to deliver oxygen to the baby. Then you might see fetal distress. But in most cases, you will not see fetal distress because the blood that you lose through the placenta previa is mom's blood. How do you diagnose this? Usually it's a clinical diagnosis, and you typically have some hints that it's gonna be happening. Uh, this is, at least, in, at least in moms that have had routine prenatal care, you'll have a hint. This is because any kind of ultrasound, transvaginal or transabdominal, as part of routine prenatal care, typically assesses placental, placental position, and it's usually pretty well documented if somebody is following up with their ob throughout the pregnancy. So usually you have some awareness um, that it's gonna happen before you actually have any kind of bleeding in the third trimester. Lastly, a quick word on management. There are some specific management steps depending on when the bleeding actually happens, before and after uh, 37 weeks. I'm not gonna get into those details here, but in general, a lower segment C-section is preferred for these moms, and there are some very specific criteria to attempt a vaginal delivery in somebody that has complete coverage of the internal os in their placenta previa. Those conditions, definitely, you wanna have a stable mother, you want baby status to be okay, so a reassuring fetal status, and you only want to attempt vaginal delivery if you're in the operating room, if you're able to convert to a C-section, if an emergency requires that. So this has been a short video on placenta previa. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.